Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm Srikant from Microsoft Research. I'll tell you about um, something that naturally follows from the previous talk, which is, uh, say you have a switch or a NIC that has just a few rate limiters. How do you make it mimic the behavior of something that has many more than just a few? This is joint work done with Peter and Ishai, uh, colleagues at MSR, and Gautam, who interned with us uh, last summer. So just a step back, for those of you who are uh, kind of new to this space, um, we are talking about network allocation in data centers. And increasingly, it's becoming uh, a performance and a cost bottleneck. As a result, there's a lot of Looks great on my screen. Let me change the font. Give me a second. Looks like some of the newer fonts from PowerPoint are not uh, projecting on this monitor. any better? Yeah. All right. Sorry about the real time. Still not that good. Um, so we're looking at functionality, functionality that tries to do performance isolation in cloud. So you have two different tenants coming in, and you want to keep their functionality different. So one of them runs a map reduce cluster. You don't want the map memcached cluster to get booted out. Uh, you'd also want to do, uh, if, you're, if you're both carrying customer traffic and bulk traffic, you want to make sure that the customer traffic either gets low latency or gets preferential access to the network versus bulk. Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff for latency and trough filling. There are a bunch of solutions out there, including some that Shiva had pointed out. Essentially, they fall into two classes. The blue sky solutions require new switches or new NICs. You have to do better packet processing. There are a bunch of other solutions that are end host based. So these are mostly in software. But as Shiva was also saying, they have to infer the network state. This is, this is key, actually. If you're shaping on the network, you don't really have to do, uh, you don't really have to figure out based on drops or losses to figure out what the actual usable bandwidth is end to end, like TCP does. And not having to do that actually improves, uh, or having to do that in, makes your logic quite complex. This performance penalty, if you're rate limiters are implemented in software. And you need every host on your network to be doing this. So if a new server joins in, or if you have a new VM, then you're kind of screwed. So the question we're asking ourselves is, can we achieve these desired allocations with, by leveraging features that are already available in commodity switches? <coughs> we do not want new switches. We do not want to just end host software solutions. The answer I'm going to try to convince you is yes. And we want to use shapers that exist in switches. So what are shapers? Think of a shaper as something that looks like this. These could be weighted fair queues, priority queues, or rate limiters. It's essentially some memory management followed by a scheduling logic. So you have to do a little bit of both. You have to have uh, memory managing and scheduling logic. I'm going to try to convince you simply that things like bandwidth carving can be done by mapping traffic into weighted fair queues. And things like better latency can be obtained by mapping traffic into priority queues. This is not the whole story, but it's not really relevant to us. It's only part of the story. Thanks. 
The central problem, though, is that the number of shapers you need to pull this off is many more than the num is the number of classes that are in your network. There are hundreds of tenants, thousands of VMs, tens of thousands of flows, and the number of shapers, as we've all known so far, is between eight and 16. Would, could you build better devices? Should we just wait for better NICs to come in or better switches to come? I'm not a hardware expert, so I don't really know how this is gonna work, but my sense is that, having talked to people like Nick McEwen, is that you need higher verification cost. Even if nothing else, you have to have more time to verify that the logic is going to work, so the cost is going to go higher. Uh, the claim we are trying to make is you do not need to do it. You can certainly go ahead and do it, but probably you don't. So this is the high-level problem. We want to mimic the behavior of a device that has many more shapers, a NIC or a switch, with a device that only has a handful of them. Put more concretely, say you have n classes coming in, and you wanted to approximate a switch that has n shapers. With a switch that has, say, some k shapers, where k is much smaller than n, how do we measure this shaping? We look at the output of a switch. This might not be just one. This might be an n2n1. We look at the output profile of the shaper and the output profile <coughs> of our modified shaper, and we look at the error. Some example errors could be if you're doing bandwidth carving, root mean square error between the bandwidths that you get by using just a few shapers versus what you'd have gotten in the ideal case when you were explicitly rate limiting everybody. <laughs> or it could be a difference in the probability of meeting deadlines. <clears throat> so here's a one slide overview of what we're going to do here. <coughs> to build something like this, what we do is we put TCAM rules that map different classes onto the fewer shapers. So certainly we have more classes and fewer shapers, so this is a many-to-one mapping. How do we figure out which many-to-one mapping is better than the another? We also get free demand estimates from these TCAM rules, and periodically we adapt this mapping of which class goes to which shaper. As you must already be thinking, the main problem is how do you get this many-to-one mapping? How do you get this many-to-one mapping when the demand estimates keep changing all the time or are, are, are not correct? And something that I won't cover in this talk is how do you use multiple switches along a path? Can you do something better as opposed to having just one? So let's look at challenge one and two. Let's take a very specific context. You're using priority queues to do strictly preferential access to network bandwidth. Say you have nine queues. The packets in the first queue get the network bandwidth no matter what. And only after they're served, the packets in the second queue get access, then the third queue, then the fourth queue. This is what you want to enforce. <clears throat> now imagine, suppose you know the demands in each of those queues, and it turns out the first three queues have demand that's less than capacity, but when you consider the fourth, the demand increases cap over capacity. What's going to happen now? All of the five bottom queues are going to get no service because the capacity is already done. The top three are going to be completely served, and the fourth guy is going to get whatever remains. Right? So if this is the case, all you need is three priority queues. You map the first three onto the top priority queue, the fourth guy onto the middle one, and the bottom five onto the third one. Clearly, this is also in strict priority order. So this guy is going to get no service. This guy, is, the fourth guy maps here, he's going to get whatever remains after the first guy is done. And the first guy has demands that are below the capacity, so he's going to get all the demands met. <laughs> but you'd already be thinking this is really toyish. I'm trying to tell you that I know precisely what the demands are. And yes, I told you I'll periodically adapt this mapping, but what if I can't do it fast enough? What if the demands change quickly? We have an algorithm, and I'm going, only going to give you a sketch. Rather than give you the exact demand, we, we model these demands as random variables. And rather than tell you exactly which class is the critical class, I'm going to compute probability about, of a certain priority queue being critical. Critical means everything below it is satisfiable, but including this one and the next one, it's not satisfiable. And everybody below gets nothing. So if you map the probability distribution, what we are essentially trying to do is partition 
the priority queues into few uh, groups as so there's map there, but the main thing is say you have three queues, then this is the best you can do. Now say you have two more. How could you use those two more to, to protect against these demand changes? You could probably want to put, these are always going to get served, right, the first few. And these are always going to not get served. It's here where there's confusion. You don't really know which one might get served and which one might not get served. So the intuition is open these up. Don't put them all into the same queue. And this is essentially the intuition I'm formalizing here. If, this is the, if the probability of this guy being a critical queue is high, then you put him in a queue by himself. Or if his demand variation is really high, then you put him in a queue by himself. There's a closed form expression. It kind of looks like a derangement. Um, how do you get k minus 1 partitions out of n plus k minus 1 plus? Uh, so here's another example. Like before, say you had 9 weighted fair queues, though, and you wanted to do weighted fair <laughs> allocation. What is weighted fair? Each class comes with a demand and a weight. And you want to divide capacity proportional to the weights. So say they each have demands and weights. And you put them on this normalized demand to weight axis, d over w. Um, does this look okay? I have no idea why the fonts are work, not working for me today. Um, so you compute a normalized fair rate alpha. And what happens is all classes that have rates below their demands, below, sorry, that have demands below their normalized fair rate are, are completely satisfied. Because they're underweight. They're asking for less than they can, could have gotten given their weights. Those that have higher are so. We call them overweight. And they get rates that are proportional to their weight times the alpha function. So how do we group these guys nicely into fewer queues? The first intuition is if you lump all of these underweight guys into the same queue, then you, you lose nothing. Because they're all underweight, the sum of their demands is still going to be underweight. And they're still going to get served. The second intuition is if you pick people who have the same <coughs> demand to weight ratio, they're as competitive as any other. So they're not going to worry too much. So they're not going to have any loss among themselves. In fact, the loss is going to be highest when you group people who are much far apart on their demand to weight axis. Because then the guy with uh, the more competitiveness is going to steal from the guy with the lower competitiveness. So under some technical assumptions, we prove uh, the nature of, a, of, a, of an optimal partitioning. We have a dynamic programming solution that gives you uh, the optimal answers. And we have a greedy solution that's a little bit faster, a little less space, but tries to approximate what the dynamic programming solution does. Just to show you a couple of evaluation results, um, the first one we did was we looked at traffic from a production network from a top of rack uplink in Bing. It's a cluster that runs MapReduce. And what you have here are the time on the x-axis, the number of flows on this link, the number of jobs on the link, and the shaping error when you're using vShaper to give you equitable allocation when you just had eight weighted fair queues. So naively, the number of jobs you have are roughly 100. So if you wanted per job allocations, then you had to have a per job queue. If you did not have that, if you did not have that, what would have happened is that jobs vary in the number of flows. So putting everybody in the same queue gives you a lot of uh, non-uniformity, gives you significantly far away from fairness. We find that vShaper gets about 3% error with just eight weighted fair queues. To check whether or not we can actually implement something like this, we ran Python scripts on top of an Arista EOS shell. It's a 7048S switch. At, at, at some level, all vShaper requires is these two things. It has, to count, it has to count the demands per class. It has to count how much traffic there is per class. And it, every adaptation interval, it has to adjust which class goes to which shaper and maybe configure that shaper. So for the first one, what we do is we put a TCAM root, like I told you in the past. And for the second one, we change the weights on the shaper and change the mapping. 
So for these things, we, we ran uh, some micro benchmarks. The, f the top few are about the adaptation interval. We need to change the shaper. We change shapers in bulk. We make a shaper point. We, we change a rule to point to a different shaper. The bottom few are about inserting stuff for a new class. You put a new rule in. Uh, you do other things. The takeaway is that most of these things that need to be frequently done require no more than a couple milliseconds. So we should be able to adapt once every 50 milliseconds or so. So we ran some simulations to compare alternate methods of grouping. Um, the number of classes is exponential. The demands and weights are Pareto distributed. And the goal is weighted fair share between these classes. So this graph is going to be a little dense. Um, on the x-axis is the number of shapers. On the y-axis is the normalized error. It's the 90th percentile over a traffic set. Uh, these three schemes are from um, net share and random. They seem about the same. Um, this one's called geometric partitioning. It's a, it's a static one that divides on d over w uh, in a geometric axis. And these two are the dynamic partitioning and our algorithm. Two things to take away. Um, Somehow, even a small number of shapers seems to give you a sizable reduction in the error. And when you have even eight shapers, you get much smaller errors than you would typically get. This is 90th percentile. The, the maxes also look about the same. Uh, there's a bunch of related work. Uh, this slide is just to explicitly name all of them. I bend them into two categories, the categories that use end host enforcement and the categories that require new hardware. NetShare, this is Shiva and other people in the room. Uh, they were actually the first to propose that traffic shapers should be used for uh, some network allocation functionality. They, they showed it for uh, bandwidth shape sharing. In, in that sense, we are motivated by them. And our contribution is to show how to use the small number of shapers when you have many more classes, and that it actually is feasible to do something like that. To summarize, um, if there's one thing you'll remember, given hopefully that's not the fonts, <laughs> it's that the behavior of many shapers can be mimicked by an algorithm that adaptively maps classes to shapers and uses only a handful of them in hardware. If you can pull something like this off, what it buys you is that you're able to use in-network components <coughs> rather than just leverage end-to-end -end control loops. And this is going to get you simpler logic. It's going to get stronger guarantees. You don't really need your host to conform. You don't need, really need software patches to go out all the time. And you also can get better performance. You don't have to worry about SRIOE because, well, the things are happening in the network. They're not happening on the hypervisor anymore. Uh, there's still a few open issues. Why are just a few shapers enough? We have something that looks like a small world phenomenon. It seems to be that just a few gets you quite a bit there. And we don't know yet what, why exactly that is. Uh, how do you use effectively multiple switches along a path? And we don't have end-to-end -end implementation and deployment yet, so we don't know how easy or hard that's going to be. Happy to take questions. Uh, you have more classes than the shaper, but usually the shaper has some buffers. So how does it affect the buffer and the cost of the package drops? And uh, do you have some comments on that? Uh, so the buffers actually, um, the, the number of, the, the size of the buffer does not directly impact us, uh, the, the buffer per shaper. Uh, what in some sense impacts us is, um, which classes are going to get mapped onto the same shaper? So if, if you put people in a priority queue, and the, so the classes that are in that priority queue are very different, as in you put somebody with a priority 1 and a priority 100, then you have a problem, because the guy with priority 100 will steal priority 1. Uh, but the, the length of that buffer, I guess you could argue that the length of the buffer complicates things, causes more potential for unfairness when you group different people. Because if the buffer is really small, then there's only so much that the guy with priority 100 can steal from the guy with priority 1. But you do all cause some messy problems, right? Because right, right. You map but different ways, and the, 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 the buffer has limited the size, and the, that priority, everything got involved, really complicated. Let me say it differently. I think that the buffer length is interesting, but it's probably a second-order phenomenon. 
what is first order is the nature of people who are going in. For example, if the guy with priority 100 is pushing traffic that's 10 times as high rate as the guy with priority 1, then it really does not matter how much the buffer size is for the priority queue. The guy with priority 100 is still going to be stealing enough from priority 1. You see what I'm saying? The buffer does manifest. I mean, if the buffer is really small versus buffer is really large, it does change things. But it, the constituents match, matter more. I'll wait talk later. OK. Hi, George Porter, UC San Diego. I, this is a very interesting talk, uh, really interesting work. I think this multiple switches along the path thing is actually quite interesting. And I know you haven't necessarily gone down that path, um, so to speak. But um, do you have a sense um, in terms of, you know, you talked about the small world phenomenon where you could use a couple cues or a couple of these shapers for a large amount of traffic. It, do, you, do you have a sense for if you were to think about multiple paths in the network, whether the kind of traffic shapers you'd see at each device would look quite similar across different uh, switches? Or do you think that there might be a lot of variation about the kind of shaping you would do, even if you have a cluster of machines that are effectively doing the same thing just in parallel? Yeah, thanks. Um, so, the, so let me try to tell you why, how we think multiple switches can actually help. Um, it looks like it's um, intuitively what you can feel is like only one of, the sh one of the switches is going to be the bottleneck. So the other guys, they're not the bottleneck. They have twice as much capacity, so they're not going to be useful for shaping. But what we've found in our early experiments is that it kind of starts looking like whack the mole. Because if you shape at a switch that is even has a higher bandwidth, it can whack the bigger guys. Like if somebody is having demand that's 10 times his weight, he'll get whacked. He won't get really whacked to something that looks like the final shaping on the bottleneck, but he'll still be his demand to weight ratio would not be as skewed as if he was coming unfiltered. Uh, now, your question about multiple paths, I think the best thing we can do with multiple paths is if you can put some groups of traffic on some and another, other groups of traffic on the other, then you, do have, you add the number of classes that you can support across two paths. But that might not entirely always happen because the demands might not uh, fit in any one path. And if you have variability, as long as it's between 4 and 8, we've not really thought about how much of the variability will help. But I kind of think we should be able to adjust to that. Hey, um, I'm wondering, you know, when you collapse traffic in same bins, basically, you always have so, you might always have some noisy neighbor, neighbor issue. Uh, now, I kind of. When you call us based on priority and say these two guys are kind of using the same thing and have the same way, you know, uh, if you have well behaved flows like TCPs that will shrink and grow together, I guess. Uh, I guess that might be, I'm more wondering like if you have a UDP kind of, you know, aggressive, but still you want to wait for it because that's important to you for some reason, right? And you collapse it with a TCP. And effectively, the demand of the UDP is going to grow. The one of the TCP is going to go lower. Like, how do you deal with noisy neighbor in that case? Yeah, I'm glad you brought this up because uh, the, the theoretically, our models uh -huh. are assuming non-reactive traffic. In that sense, they're they're more correct if your traffic is UDP than if your traffic is TCP, because we are assuming that a demand exists that is independent of the shaping behavior. Right. This is not entirely true if you have TCP, because TCP only sends as much as you're draining; it doesn't send any more. Right. Now, having said that, I believe that. If you have traffic that's not one flow, one TCP flow, but it's a collection of TCP flows, say 20 or 50 TCP flows, then my sense is that it looks starts looking unreactive because that bundle of traffic has, has the same demand as it would have had. Because yeah. maybe one of them is getting, uh, one, of them, one of the flows is getting smaller, but the other guy is getting more. And this model actually works the right thing if you have unreactive traffic. Like traffic always asks its demand. Right. Then this model is the appropriate one. Right. Okay. Cool. Thank you.